Okay, so hopefully if there are people waiting in the wings, then um, we should be having the numbers coming up gradually as we go. There's quite a lot of people who are going to be watching this back afterwards. So um, I think uh, attendee numbers may not be massive, but I've already had plenty of messages to say that there'll be people watching the playback because they can't attend this evening. So um, hopefully we'll get plenty. Oh yes, numbers are popping up. Hi everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to wait a few minutes uh, for everybody to log on and to uh, get through the waiting room. This session is being recorded, so if there's anyone you know who can't make it this evening who um, you know would like to watch this back afterwards, um, then do feel free to tell them about it. The um, sessions are all going to be on the Women in Racing website and we're going to promote them through our social media as well. So. Um, do feel free to share them about. Um, this is the first of a series of interviews that we're going to be doing for women in racing. So um, there will be more to come um, and uh, there'll be plenty more interesting people that we're going to be talking to over the next few weeks. If you have any questions, um, I would suggest that you use the Q&A box for me if possible. You can use the chat box as well. Um, we'll try and monitor those questions as we go through the interview. We've got around about an hour. So um, Amory and I will chat for a while, but do pop your questions in if you have anything burning that comes up and I will try and weave them in or we'll take a Q&A at the end as we go. Okay. Lovely. Well, thank you, Anna-Marie, ever so much for joining us. Um, it's an absolute joy to have you. And um, we're really pleased that you're the first person that's um, going to be in our Careering Ahead uh, series. For those of you who don't know Anna-Marie, and she doesn't really need much introduction, <laughs> um, but she is the current chair of the BHA. Um, she is also currently, just to give her a little, little bit of potted history, the vice chair of the British Olympic Association. She is the vice chair of European Rowing. She competed in the Women's Eight at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta and also holds a CBE for her uh, work and her contributions to rowing. Um, she is an uh, incredibly eminent uh, woman in sport and the wider uh, governance and regulation of sport, and she's had a stellar career, so we're really delighted that she's going to chat to us this evening. Um, I, I wanted to um, open Amory by asking, actually, um, you've obviously had a very varied career, but what was it that you wanted to do when you were little? Did you have any idea when you first started about where you wanted your career to go? Gosh, um, I don't know. I think the first thing I really wanted to do was to work in the art world. The thing, the first sort of real job that I, I kind of had set my heart on probably when I was at school, um, I loved, I loved art and drawing and I was never very good at it, but I was convinced I was going to be a graphic designer and I wanted to design album covers, you know, for those of us who remember 12 inch album very covers, good. Yeah. that was my thing. And I just, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to go to art college and just work in a studio and, and produce beautiful things. Yeah. Were you really into music and art when you were growing up then? You mentioned album covers. That's kind of a throwback to the good old days. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, you know, anyone that grew up in the, in the seventies and, and early eighties will kind of remember the excitement of saving up your pocket money and going mm. out to buy that single or that album. And you would then take it home. It was a real investment and you just listened to it nonstop. Mm. Um, so, you know, my first album was, was, I think, Parallel Lines by Blondie. And I, I, I must have worn it thin. I think it was kind of see-through <laughs> by the time I finished with it. Um, but it was, it was really exciting. And, and those fabulous albums that opened up and, you know, were full and of... the artwork on those was... Just, every last bit. Yeah, so fabulous. Words well. on the inside sleeve and everything. It was great. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. So you went off to um, Cambridge to study geography. And um, I was doing a bit of research for this interview earlier. And um, I sh there was a story to say that you were encouraged into rowing by your tutor. Can you tell us about that and how you got into <laughs> so, rowing to begin with? So, yeah, so I, I uh, actually, I... I applied to um, to art college and to Cambridge. Those were my sort of two okay. first choices, and and I got places at both, but I couldn't get funding for both. At okay. the time, we had local authority grants, and they said they would do one year at art college or three years at Cambridge. And my parents, much to my disgust, my parents said, "Well, it's got to be Cambridge." And I was like, <laughs> "Oh no, I think it's got to be art college." Um, anyway, they strong armed me um, all the way up to Cambridge, and. I had a riot actually. I had a fantastic first year. I had a bar bill that was sort of stretched from one end of the <laughs> courtyard to the other. Um, 
went to most of my lectures but I don't quite know what I did in them um and I I did every I wasn't very good at sports but I played football I played netball um I did shot put uh for the college and 1500 meters and whatever I had a whole pile of friends I had a boyfriend who was the rugby captain and um at the end of my first year when we did our exams my exam results were so poor my academic tutor took me aside and he said now um this is a high risk strategy but I would like to suggest you get some structure in your life and you stay out of the bar and can I suggest that you go down to the rowing club and uh, and do something useful with your time when you're not studying um so I, I kind of laughed at him and thought he was joking but he wasn't joking and he checked up on me and, and eventually I, I did persuade my best friend to come to the rowing club with me and we started to row actually she was much better than I was um, but I, I really enjoyed it and loved it and it gave me some real purpose in life and some of those people I met and you know I'm still connected with that club now mm. um, so it just sort of kicked off something and it, it, it's one of those sports that you know people are passionate about and slightly obsessive about there's a lot of parallels between rowing and racing I think in terms of the community spirit and the way you work together and and the sort of the passion and the sort of obsession side of things mm. Mm. So. And um, you you were initially a lightweight rower, is that right? Um, when you were at college, and you know, having met you, you're not. I think we tend to associate rowers with being very tall, very strong. Um, and I often think that it's a sport that some people might not necessarily think about getting into because they might think that physically they're not um, kind of made for it. I suppose. Like, can you talk a little bit about the differences between the two and how you switch between them? Because I know you switched between codes, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I, I actually I started off as a. a as a not a lightweight, as it were. I mean, it's, it's hard to say the opposite to lightweight is usually heavyweight, but you know, <laughs> I, people who are heavyweights don't like to talk about themselves as heavyweights because there's no such thing as heavyweight, it's an open weight. So I started off just rowing um, for my college and then rowed in the university reserve boat, uh, the Cambridge University reserve boat, which is called Blondie. So that tied in quite nicely with my yeah. first. <laughs> um, They'll be Harry all the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, when I then went down to London after I left university, I didn't row for a while, but I kind of got dragged in back into it by friends who always were looking for somebody to sub into a boat. And I eventually joined the rowing club and, and carried on. And um, there was a point at which, because I, I'm, I mean, I'm five foot nine, so I'm not short by any means, I don't think. Hmm. Um, but there was a point at which I was rowing in a pair with a girl and, and our coach said to us, you know, you two are between you, if you just, both slimmed down a bit and lost a little bit of weight you'd make a really fast lightweight pair if you can keep your speed up and do that and so we we put together a pair and then we put together a four um to be lightweight in rowing you have to be and i can't remember what it is in imperial but it's 57 kilograms as an average so you can be up to 59 kilograms which was my maximum weight um or you can you, the crew average altogether has to be 57 um, and, uh, you know, we, we did a bit of lightweight rowing and um, we won national championships and things like that. And eventually our coach said to us, you know, actually, why don't we try going to national team trials? And she, my, my crewmate was really keen to do national team trials. And so we just trogged off to, at the time, they were at Thorpe Park, actually. Mm. If you go down the um, uh, M3 these days, past where Thorpe Park is, you go past a big stretch of water, and that's where the national team trials used to be wow. um, before they had any facilities of their own. And mm. and we we went to trials and we did quite well. And you know, I, I was actually I was selected and she wasn't, I'm afraid. But um, in '91, I found myself going to Vienna for the World Championships, um, and we won a silver medal. So um, it was a really exciting start. And um, you know, I, it sort of didn't really want to give up then um mm. i was really enjoying it and that was the sort of start of your heyday with, with there were three silver medals in the world championships and one gold eventually in the early 90s um which really is like you know kind of the halcyon days of, of rowing really for you i suppose um, but you were working as well at the same time how did you juggle your career and um and your sport at the same time because obviously you sort of think back that rowing is mostly amateur in those days compared to now where if you were rowing in the world championships you'd be on a central contract and all the rest of it how did you create that balance between your working days and your rowing career well I, they always say you can only do two things in life so <laughs> it was work and rowing at the time um i we used to row really early in the morning and then late at night and and cycle to work in between and 
um, if you go back to my my original wanting to work in the art world, um, having failed to go to art college and, and therefore not doing graphic design, I um, ended up working for an auctioneers in Bond Street and then moved from there to a dealer who specialised in a particular part of British decorative arts. And so I would sort of cycle. Um, I lived in Putney. I would cycle down to the boat club, do an hour and a half on the water, grab some lunch, uh, cycle into Kensington or into Bond Street um, at the time, do my day's work and then cycle back to do my weights in the evening and then back home, back to sleep. And then it all started again. So it really was just eating and sleeping and rowing and working. And it was fairly monotonous, but you know, like anything like that, it becomes your life. So, you know, rowing is like racing is a sort of lifestyle thing. It's not just mm. a sport that you do um, on, a, on a Saturday afternoon. And, um, and it was quite addictive and, and we were doing well. So particularly those first four years in the lightweight four, I was fairly consistently selected and, um, uh, you know, we, we stood on the, on the podium and, and, you know, there is nothing nicer than standing on the podium and have somebody tell you you're a world champion. Yeah. And where are all your medals now? I always wonder what people who've got a gold medal do with it. <laughs> oh, where are they? Um, well, I don't have them here. I should have got them out <laughs> should have shown you them. They're not that close to me anymore, no. but they are in a cupboard outside. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> such an amazing achievement to have, though. Like, you've got that for your whole life to say that, you know, you've won a, you've won a gold medal in the World Championships, which is quite amazing. Um, and so from there on, um, you qualified to go to the Olympics in 96. And I know um, something I read you'd said in a quote that that was one of the biggest disappointments of your professional mm. and, and kind of personal career. Can you talk a little bit about what happened there and how you bounced back after that? Um, I, I think... You know, I think I was stretching myself. So I was, uh, as a lightweight, physiologically, as a lightweight, I was really strong. So I had all the long levers and, you know, whatever else. I, I have, happened to have quite a good lung capacity. Um, and moving up from lightweight up to heavyweight or open weight meant I had to put on quite a lot of strength. And I did it over a season from nine, between 94 and 95. And it was quite a struggle. Um, and I, I had quite a hard time as well. I, I had um, the crew moving from a four of, you know, quite like-minded people into an eight that was quite disparate, was quite hard. Um, as the lightweight in the crew, um, I was, you know, not always, people always kind of looked at me, if things weren't right, they'd always think it was, you know, oh, is it because we've got a lightweight, you know, up in the bows of the boat. Um, and, I, and I really struggled mentally, actually, both with the sort of, I don't want to call it bullying, but sort of constant niggling um, from people that, you know, was I working hard enough? Was I strong enough? Should I be in the crew or not? Um, the, the coach I had, had coached me all the way through the four and actually he was lovely and he really helped build my confidence. And, you know, he said, you know, we want a winner. We want somebody in here who knows how to race and how to win. Mm -hmm. So you, we need you in the boat. Um, but it was really hard, actually, those, those two years. And, at one point I ended up with overtraining syndrome. So I was mm. training so hard to try and keep up and do better and to beat these other women who were so much bigger and you know, theoretically stronger. They weren't actually any better, but um, that I ended up overtraining and um, I had to take a, a couple of months out over the winter of um, 95 to 96. Um, uh, had antidepressants um, and, and really, really, really struggled with my, my mental health and my physical health at that time. Um, uh, but I was determined that I was going to to go to 96 and to have my moment of seeing what the Olympic Games was like um, and, and it was it was amazing to be part mm. of it was like a fantastic sporting party I wouldn't miss it for the world um, now that I've been through it but it was at the time really hard to uh, to get through and you know to sort of not just to give up and say you know it's just not worth it. Mm. Mm. there's a couple of things I was just going to pick out of that actually which was um in terms of being the lightweight the most lightweight of the crew I presume required an amazing technique if you're not um working on strength and and your skill and attention to detail must be very high do you think that has translated into your career subsequently like are you a technical detail kind of person I'm not sure but I am <laughs> <laughs> I think I think as a lightweight you are you do tend to be sort of slightly more agile and, and slightly more physically you know physically probably better technically in at doing something physical mm. um, I think that what it really taught me and that I brought into later life is you know 
is just the sheer hard work that you really do sometimes need to things it doesn't come easy so if you want to do something um you know i spend a lot of time preparing for something you know if there's something new coming up or there's something i feel that i don't know about i will read about it prepare for it practice it um you know and, and i think as a sports person anyway you do that you know you don't go out to a race and do anything different than you've been doing for the last six months mm -hmm. everything about your training is all about getting your body to automatically feel comfortable doing the sorts of things you're going to do on race day and if you rock up on race day and you start to do something different then you're in trouble so i you know i, I think there's a lot in life that you do and I, and I think taking that sort of learning about preparation and learning about this is how I've practiced it and I need to now deliver it in the same way mm. that I've been practicing is is kind of you know, you'll know that from being a vet you don't mm. do an operation and practice it <laughs> you know when you're training and then suddenly you think oh I'll do something completely different on this animal yeah today. Yeah, yeah it's just about repetition isn't it yeah. and getting your getting your skills up and similarly do you think um the experiences around you said you mentioned that the team dynamics in the eight boat were a little bit tricky at times mm. do you, you uh, you've presumably learned a lot from that which you've implemented in the working I was thinking about you know working in difficult situations with conflicting personalities trying to gel a team together to pull towards a a common cause do you think that your rowing career was a huge help in that as you moved on into work afterwards gosh I'd, uh, you know uh, possibly it's always easy to think retrospectively about mm. what you've done and how it might have impacted what you're doing I, I don't know if it did or not but certainly it was difficult it was a really difficult time to build consensus and to bring people together and I I don't know if I learned from that how to do it or if I learned from that that I needed to work harder at doing that at the time um but certainly you know eight you know eight or nine hormonal women you know with conflicting views about what's the right way to go i mean we, we had one bit we had a we had our b final so we, we didn't make the a final we didn't come in the top six we went out to race the b final and our coach gave us a screwdriver as we pushed off he said to us good luck i've got no idea what the wind is like that out there he said but when you get out there and you feel the wind on your back, here's a screwdriver. If you need to adjust your gearing on the blades, make the decision and do it. And of course there were these nine women, the cocks and the eight women, I'm up in the bows with the wind on my back. And um, there was no way, there was no way in hell's, on hell's earth that we were going to be able to reach a consensus about what to do about that. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of learn at that point that actually, sometimes you just have to let things go um actually it was fine we, we did okay and we, we won our b final but um you know it that those sorts of distractions you learn that you don't give people the choice <laughs> you don't give people the choice when they're going out there for a critical race you've made that decision you've prepared for that um and you reach consensus before you get to that critical point because yeah. otherwise you've got no chance no chance yeah definitely and so subsequent to the olympics you made a decision to um to stop rowing kind of professionally as it was um, and went back to work. How did you come to make that decision and, and what were the kind of reasons around that? And did you find it hard? We, you know, we often talk about the transition of professional athletes and particularly the supplies in, in racing and jockeys as well. And you and I spoke briefly about what it's like when you transition out. How did you find that return to work and, and kind of losing that um, repetitive day-to-day -day routine, as you mentioned, which gives your life so much structure? Yeah, I, 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 um, I did find it quite difficult. I mean, I, I was really keen to give up by the time I'd gone through it. And I'd had those two years of really not feeling that I was you know, a valued member of the crew. Mm. Um, I had a, you know, I had a boyfriend that I am now married to. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I was 30 at that stage. So, you know, mm. beginning to get to the point of thinking, actually, there's more to life than hanging around these miserable bunch of people well no they weren't all. some of them were very good friends let me be, be careful but you know one or two made my life miserable so mm. you know, am I really happy doing this there, there was no at that point as well 96 of course you have to remember 96 was the worst Olympics mm. um, in British history just about I think we came 36th on the medal table um, where there was only one gold medal won by the entire team and there was no funding there was no funding for women's rowing mm. we had no coach we had a volunteer coach and um you know there wasn't really much to stick around for and i'd been working part-time by that stage um for a quite a big gallery in bond street the fine arts society and they offered me a directorship 
they said, you know, if you're going to come back from games, we'd love you to work here. Why don't you come? We'll make you a board director. Um, wow. So, <laughs> you know, there were too many, too many yeah. alternatives, you know, age, whatever, body clock, all sorts of things going on. Um, and so I decided that I would give up the rowing and do that. And actually, I oh, did I miss it immediately? I, I carried on rowing for quite a bit of time, actually, and with quite a lot of the same girls. So we went and rowed for our club for a year um, and, uh, and, and you know, had a fantastic time because we were, we were all quite fit and strong and we've been on the national team, so we won <laughs> almost everything. So we had a great time um, just rowing at, at club level. And... Um, uh, and then I started to have children and, you know, other things happened. And I guess the other thing that happened at that point was that my, the, the chairman of the national governing body at that time, the Amateur Rowing Association, was a lady called Dialis. And she tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, throughout your time as an athlete, you've been quite vocal about the rights of athletes and what athletes should be and shouldn't be. And, you know, how involved they should be in decision making. So, so now's your time, now's your chance. I want you to chair the Women's Rowing Commission. And I looked at her and I thought, no way am I doing something like that. You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, not getting involved in the politics of it all. And um, she said to me, no, 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 just, just come along and see what it's about. We need people who, you know, have opinions and people who are prepared to say things that are, you know, uh, unpopular sometimes. So she tricked me into going to this meeting, this Women's Rowing Commission meeting. And I arrived there and sat down and the woman who was chairing the meeting called Di, another Di, stood up and she brought this piece of pile of paper in front of me and she said, Anna-Marie, congratulations on taking over as chair of the Women's <laughs> Rowing Commission. She said, I'm off, see you all. And she left Hi. me in this room in, with this table full of women. And um, that was really, you know, how I started doing sort of sports admin and politics and whatever. Um, which was a bit of a cheat really but uh, you know, we, we got on with it and, and we had a great time. Mm. Di Ellis you mentioned her um, her name cropped up a lot when I was reading about women in rowing and um, she seems to have been quite the trailblazer as the first female steward at the Henley Regatta and um, various other um, bits and pieces. Has she been um, an important kind of friend and mentor in your career and, and apart from her have there been other people who you've really felt have kind of encouraged you and, and brought you along? Uh, yes, absolutely. Di, Di, I mean, she sadly died a few years ago and it was oh, you know, the, the outpouring from across the sports, both male and female, actually, of people that she'd helped and encouraged was incredible. Um, she had rode in the 60s. She was quite a, quite a small lady. She'd rode in the 60s and she was um, elected as chair of British Rowing. Well, she, she basically she was my predecessor as chair of British Rowing. She was there for 24 years. Wow. Um, in the time when there was no term limits on how long you could be there for. Um, but she was just a very wise person, really wise, really good listener. Um, and she was always there to, 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 to offer advice if you wanted it. Um, but equally, she would be the sort of person who tap you on the shoulder and would tell you when you should be doing something or shouldn't be doing mm. something. So she was never frightened to upset people. Um, she kept she was she was really really good at reading the situation. Um, she was always quite quiet, um, but she was always there, and she would always be the one who says, you know, do you know what time you moved on? You've done that one for too long. Think about doing something different. Um, and in the end, actually, when I stood down from British Rowing. Um, largely because the, the code for sports governance um, meant I had timed out because I had been her deputy chairman for 11 years before I then right. became chairman. Okay. Um, she, you know, she'd been the one saying, you know, you just go, move on, you know, time to change. And, and she was very good at that, at, at, even though she was always around for, for so long. <laughs> she was really good at moving people on, giving them fresh ideas, um, mm. even into her 80s. She mm. was incredible. That's amazing, isn't it? And actually to have that longevity without people deposing you out of, you know, boredom or spite or whatever else it happens, jealousy or whatever else it happens to be is quite a, a brilliant reflection of her personality and her skills by the sounds of it. And um, the other thing I was just going to come back to, you've alluded to your husband and, and you've got children as well. And um, how have you managed the juggle over the years? You know, it's something often women talk about in their careers. Um, that we can't have it all or can you have it all and and how has that manifested and and um 
been for you over the last years of, in terms of, you know, you've held very responsible positions that presumably have been quite time consuming. Have you, do you feel that that is something that has been straightforward, very difficult, somewhere in between? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I guess, I mean, I remember when I first had my kids, and um, they're not children anymore, they're 22, 20 and 18, so they're, they're kind of grown ups now, but um, when I remember when I first had them and saying to my mum, because my mum had worked all the way through me and my brother growing up, and saying to her, how on earth did you manage? And she said, well, we just kind of did it on a sort of, you know, week to week basis. And I remember mm. thinking, there's no way I can have my children being looked after on a week to week basis. I need to, you know, to plan ahead. I need to know that these things happen. But when it happens, actually, you put things in place, but things change and you just deal with them. You just have to look at what's the next day or the next week going to, to bring into it. Mm -hmm. um, I did stop working sort of properly, as it were, um, after the third one was born. So I had them all in quite quick succession. And when my daughter was about a year old, um, I, I took what, what I called at the time a sabbatical. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I never really went back and I, and I started doing much more sort of consultancy work. So rather than having to go into somewhere to serve clients, which you do in, a, in an art gallery mm. and having to be there for them. Um, I, I did curating work. I, I did a lot of research for people. Um, I did valuations. Um, I wrote several books, co-authored some books on, on various things that I was interested in with people. So I worked from home and, and when the kids were very little, that was, relatively easy because they would go either into nursery for a while or to school for a while you know I'd sort them out put them to bed and they'd all be beautifully tucked up really early and then I could work from eight till whenever you know eight mm. till midnight or whatever doing doing other things um uh, whereas you know then when they start getting bigger and want to stay up late and eat later <laughs> then they become then they become the problem but you know I think it's good for them to see that they've got parents mm. who work and particularly having a girl <laughs> For yeah, her to yeah. see that, um, you know, their mum's not just there all the time for them, um, and they they can they grow they've all grown up independent and and bright and and lovely lovely kids. Yeah, and actually, it's one thing I know you've been involved with the racing home workshops that have been happening, um, but it's something that's been coming up time and again is about you know having role models for working mothers and and helping women to balance childcare and and work so that people can have their careers facilitated to keep progressing and you know having someone like you who's got three children and has got such an eminent career is such a brilliant role model for other people who are having kids themselves and just leading on from the children um you've done a lot of work in safeguarding with young people in sport um first in rowing and then in wider sport can you talk to us a little bit about what safeguarding is and how you became interested in that Amory, and, and um how that's kind of grown in your career over the years yeah, I mean, again, it was, you know, I have to go back to die, Ellis. Um, so uh, having gone from the Women's Rowing Commission and through various things, I think in 2002, she tapped me on the shoulder again and said, I'm looking for a new deputy chairman. I'm setting up this new role. There was a there was obviously a chair role and a deputy chair. And she said, I need a second deputy chair um, and I'd like you to do it. And I said, I, I'd literally just had this baby. And she said, no, don't worry. The baby can come along. We'll put the baby under the table. Um, and we'll make sure you don't have to do much traveling. So the other deputy chairman was a, was a man called Gary. He did all the sort of program stuff and he traveled around the country. And I got given the, the governance portfolio, okay. um, which, you know, thought, oh God. Um, <laughs> luckily, um, I had, uh, by then I think I was already, a, I'd just been made a steward of Henry Royal Regatta. So I was second, the second female steward to her. And we had people like Adrian Cadbury, who was just the most amazing um governance man he'd written he wrote the sort of definitive book on corporate governance okay. and i went and sat down with adrian and i said adrian i've been asked to do this governance role at british rowing can you help me um so you know there were there were always people around who you could go and ask for help and support and um and you know he helped me with the sort of corporate governance bit of it and we looked at you know what were we doing as a as an organization um, I reached out to UK Sport for support over things like the anti-doping um, side of things. And, and the other area in 2002 that was really new, it seems odd to me because 2002 sounds really recent, but in 2002, almost no sport mm. uh, did anything around safeguarding. So we'd had a very rudimentary policy we'd put in place um, when I first joined the board in the late 90s, 97 or 98. Um, but by 2002, there were quite a lot of sort of 
issues coming up. Um, there was a big issue in, in swimming with one of the swimming coaches there and in tennis. And, uh, you know, I think we recognised that it was something we needed to get on top of as a sport. Um, rowing isn't a sport that has very young children in it. You tend not mm. to start until you're 14. So you tend to have slightly more mature um, kids. But there were still there were still risks and there were still sort of vulnerabilities. And um, as the deputy chair of governance, I, I wrote, you know, the, the anti doping policy, I wrote um, the equality policy and I wrote and implemented our first safeguarding our first sort of comprehensive safeguarding policy, I suppose, um, worked with the NSPCC and became really close friends with um, a lady called Anne Tivas there who uh, ran the Child Protection and Sport Unit and, and actually I have never stopped working with Anne since so she and and the people there really sort of brought us through and with a cohort of other sports in terms of understanding from first principles what safeguarding was about, where the risks were, how we could make recruitment safer for organisations how we could help educate people, what sort of communications needed to be done, you know, and just literally the every aspect of it from, you know, disciplinary procedures to codes of conduct to, to actually just writing the policy. Mm. Um, and I guess having done that from first principles and, and never being given a template, you know, you, you start to really understand it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And at that time, were many sports doing that sort of work? Because it seems to me that, you know, over the last few years, it's something we talk about a lot more. Um, and certainly we had those cases from football, particularly in the last couple of years of, of incidences of um, safeguarding. Was, that, was it a, an area that at that time was just not really developed at all? Or were you one of many sports that were starting to build that? Because it seems to me that it's something that is increasingly discussed in the maybe the last I've been lagging behind a bit. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, you're back. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just saying that, um, was that something that at the time a lot of sports were doing or was it something that was quite new? Because we seem to have talked a lot in the last couple of years about safeguarding in sport, particularly with regard to football and some of the instances of failures of safeguarding. Was that very new at that stage? And were you kind of amongst the forefront of sports getting policies together on that? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, clearly there had been issues around safeguarding in the past. And we look back at the sort of the Barry Bunnell, I think, is the one that you're, mm. you're alluding to with, with football. But there'd also been these crises in, in swimming and tennis that, that had really sort of come up at the end of the 90s. Um, and um, th there was a whole co cohort of sports that were developing it at the same sort of time, I suppose. So we, we developed a really good group of safeguarding officers across sports who, who worked together and who shared, you know, ideas, shared best practice, shared documentation. You know, we, we worked very closely together and, I, and, you know, I still see and keep in touch with them because you know, doing anything like that is, is quite hard. Um, mm. You know, it, it, it's unpleasant and it's not only unpleasant when you get a, a disclosure to deal with, but, you know, dealing with, with the other side of it you know the people that are being accused of it you know you're, you're trying to look at this you're trying to um investigate a case and then trying to find the right people to be able to sort of be, help you with any sort of disciplinary procedures around it and and you come under fire actually there are a lot of people who just didn't think that it happened in rowing you know there is no such thing we don't have that in a, as a problem in our sport hmm. and i think every sport had that so i think in some sports there was a bit of box ticking you know we've got to put this in place so we will in other sports they were were really like like we were in rowing very serious about trying to do it and trying to do it well mm. um mm. and you know it it was it was good for, what was great about it for me was that as the deputy chair of the organization i was able to bring it straight to the board or bring it straight to the council and say to people this is really happening we've had you know i wouldn't share details but i could say mm. You know, this year we've had so many sort of disclosures or cases and here are the sorts of things and these are the sorts of ways that you want to avoid this happening in your club so it became very real to people um and and i suppose that if you're senior enough in an, what what i really learned was if you're senior enough in an organization and you want to get something done then you can find the resources and you can get it done mm. um a, a lot of the other sports had appointed safeguarding officers who were perhaps um, 
you know, they weren't senior officers, as it were, um, but but they were sort of more junior in, mm. or they sat to one side, they weren't on the board and they didn't have a voice perhaps around the decision-making table. And they really struggled to make the sort of changes that they needed. So I do think, mm. you know, if you want to take something seriously, I, I certainly learned that you need to take it at, right at the top level and, and make yeah. sure you've got somebody championing that cause at the top. For sure, for sure. And so obviously you're now with, BHA, which is brilliant for us um, and very exciting for the industry in the whole. Um, was is racing? I know you've talked a little bit in the press about your love of racing from when you were young. Is it? Or did it come out of the blue that this job came up and you thought, oh yes, I feel like that? Or was it something that you'd kind of been interested in for a while? How did you come into racing uh, potentially as as a working prospect rather than just an enjoyment prospect, Anna Marie? Um, well, I, I I guess I. I had looked at a couple of other roles in racing, um, to be honest. So I'd looked at, you know, when other things had come up. Um, I, I really, I guess, having stood down from British rowing and then that, that left a huge gap in my life. And we talked about transitioning out of, out of something earlier on. And I said it was quite easy. Actually, at that point, when I transitioned out of what was then, I'd moved from being the Amateur Rowing Association to British Rowing, that was the point at which I transitioned out of my sport. So I've been on the national team since 1991 and I left in 2013 and I had been into that building either training or as a part of that organization for all of those years, 20 something years. Um, and it was at that point actually that, that I really felt a huge gap, you know, to drop out of your sports completely at that point and which was the right thing to do to move on and move away and let the new chairman take over. Um, but that, that really struck me. That was the first time really that I was properly transitioning out and had not, didn't really have any control over what was going on. I didn't know day to day for the first time in 20 something years, what was happening across all of our clubs. Um, so I did, I found that quite hard and I was really looking proactively for something substantial that would, you know, I could use my time with. Um, because what I found was in the first few months after I left British Rowing, um, there were a hundred million things that I could do and people would come and say oh can you do this project or that project and you, you could do things just take up your time and, and spread to sort of fill your calendar um, so I was looking for something substantial uh, I'd looked at racing roles before uh, I really enjoyed going racing uh, it's not a sport that I know a, an awful lot about or an industry about but I but I you know somebody I then got a call from a headhunter saying you know have a look at this job description, look at the experience that they're looking for and the, and the sorts of things they're looking for and what do you think? Um, and I think, I think for the first time ever, I looked at a role description or a job description and thought, oh, actually, <laughs> I can, yeah, I've done that and tick, I've done that tick, and I've done tick. that. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe, you know, I don't know very much about the racing industry, but maybe I can give it a go and, you know, maybe I'll learn something from the interview process and whatever. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I was thrilled. I was thrilled mm. to be offered the role. And, I, and I'm loving it, actually. Good. Well, we are thrilled to have you, I have to say. Um, there's a question that's come in, actually, which is, um, is there anything that has really surprised you, either good or bad, since joining the BHA and the racing industry? Cool. Um, good, pun good punchy question, <laughs> that one. <laughs> I, think, I think that racing is probably the most complex and fragmented sport that I've mm. ever come across. I mean... I, I kind of knew that it was, I, and I don't, you know, the equestrian world anyway is, is fairly fragmented. I've, I've done a bit of sort of not really work with, but I'd, I'd looked at the BEF in various, mm -hmm. for various governance type issues. And, um, and that's quite, that's quite fragmented. And so, uh, and I know that from the Olympic side. And so I'd kind of expected it from, um, uh, from the racing side but but actually it is very very complex how it all works and how the moving parts all fit together how representation is what is you know how do we make decisions and things that that's incredibly complex and I think um, it, it's just it's sort of grown and because of that then you end up with quite a lot of sort of compromised uh, decision making you know mm. so it's mm. so that 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 to me probably was a was a surprise more of a surprise than I thought it might be um, but I, but you know, the other things that is how wonderful it is how passionate people are. Um, that shouldn't shouldn't be a surprise. But it, it's been a really pleasant surprise, and I've been really pleasantly surprised by how welcoming people are. 
Mm. Um, how much time people have spent with me helping me to understand a whole new language because it is it's it's very different um I, I wouldn't by any means say i know very much at all still about actually about you know how horses do but but just trying to understand the commentary for a race is, is a whole new language for example mm. Um, mm. and how things work so yeah mm. it's been fantastic and um, there's more questions coming in. Do feel free to pop them in the Q&A, people, if you would like anything answered for Amory. But um, what do you think the biggest challenge is facing women in their careers currently and specifically in the horse racing industry? Um, gosh, I think, I think the, the biggest issue for women is that the systems that are in place haven't been set up for women. So in any sport and in any industry, you know, historically, there are, there are clearly some that, that are very female dominated, but, you know, the systems to help you advance and to help you sort of grow within them are set up so, so that you advance in, in other ways. I'm just trying to think of an example. If I, I mean, I, the, I talked, I've talked about it quite a bit, actually, in terms of sport in general, but, but sport and sport governance and, and the way sports organisations um, are developed were all set up mostly in the 19th century. Um, horse racing is probably marginally earlier and it's been slightly modified but it's still on a basically on the 19th century model where you have committee meetings where people sit around and they postulate and they argue and uh, they come to a decision based on a vote um, you know it was all done in a way that that quite often decisions are being made outside of the meeting room they're made on the golf course or they're made you know in the bar um, but they're made in a way that's not necessarily very efficient for women. And uh, if mm. you put a bunch of women together and say, how are we going to run this? They would be running it in a, in a really different way because they would be running off to make the dinner, to look after their kids. They'd be trying to juggle their jobs. Um, you know, it, it's a very different way in a very different environment, I think. Um, mm. So I, I think that we've been really good at helping women to change, to try and fit into the systems that exist. What we've been really bad at doing is changing the system to help women to excel in terms of just the way they are. Mm. Um, mm. And that, that's, a, that's a big sort of a big thing that we need to do. I've mm. forgotten there was a second part to the question. I've forgotten Naomi. Oh, no, it was uh, biggest challenges for women in their careers, both oh, in general in and in the horse racing industry. But yeah, and off the back of that, um, you, I understand if you probably don't want to comment too much, but somebody has mentioned in the questions about the current situation with Delia Bushell and the Jockey Club. In more generally from that, what do you think we can learn from situations of um, women in high positions struggling in certain circumstances to prevent people being put off from progressing in what is certainly quite a male dominated environment and considered to be very old school from both within and without the industry? Well, you know, one of the things, actually, one of the things that has surprised me <laughs> to some extent about the industry is actually how many senior women there are. There are quite a mm. lot of senior women in, in racing. If you seem to be across... another very senior woman coming in too. <laughs> yes, absolutely, <laughs> across racing. And I think it's incumbent on those of us that are there and those of us who've made it to, to look after and help support other, other women, actually. Um, you know, look behind you and, and see who you're bringing up with you mm. and make sure that you're looking after each other. Um, you know take time just take time to speak to people and, and that works across both men and women actually but I think the one of the things that women do very well usually is is to make friends and, and to try and understand and be empathetic and that's not to say that that men men can't but it, it tends to be a female sort of more feminine trait perhaps put it that way mm. um so I I think that we can be supportive um and I think that we just have to be be helpful and you know mm. try and encourage people and 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 listen listen to to women about why, where their struggles are um covid's been interesting because you know it's it's really helped some people uh, it's been hard being at home i think for a lot of women but i think equally it's helped them to get on with their jobs and to show that they can they can look after their kids and do their job from home and, and perhaps we'll all be a bit more flexible in the future mm -hmm. and if there's one thing that you could change about the industry you know, if you were given a magic wand to wave, um, what would be the one thing that you would like to see sorted out quite as quickly and as smoothly as possible? Oh, I think I needed some time to think about that one. That's really a fair <laughs> one to give me off it. One thing. <laughs> what would be the top of your changing list? I mean, you've probably got a large list, but is there anything that springs to mind that you think that needs fixing? 
uh, th th there's a re there's a reasonable there's a reasonable list. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I think I think this is a fabulous industry and it's got so much opportunity. And I I the one thing we need to do is to actually we talk an awful lot about working together and trust and stronger together and whatever else. And actually we need to follow that right through. I mean, I, mm. I, I do think that um, quite often we'll, we'll work together really well to achieve one thing, um, but, but we're very short term. And I wish that uh, we could all learn to think a bit more long term about what's the best for the whole industry and not always be thinking as individuals or individual organizations about mm. what's better for me tomorrow. Mm. Mm. Um, a couple more questions coming in. Um, is there anything you would have done differently during your working career with hindsight? Another biggie. It's quite a big question, that one. Um, gosh, if I could only, um, what would I change? I don't know that I would change very much because although there were things that you know, I probably could have done better. Uh, I, I probably could have been more successful at or whatever else. You know, you learn from all those things. So all mm. of those mistakes are, are mm. quite helpful in terms of mm. where you get to. Mm. Um, I, I think if I could change one thing, I'd like, I'd like to think I'd like a bit more confidence when I was younger. Um, I, I went from I went from a state school into Cambridge. On on I was very I did the way I got in was on, on sort of very low exam grades and, and I went in extremely unconfident. Um, and it took me an awful long time to work out that actually I just had to sometimes take a deep breath and dive in and get on with things. Um, and I think probably uh, would it have changed things in the long run? I don't know, but I'd love to have sort of found that confidence a bit earlier in my life, I think. Mm, mm. Mm. I think it's a great thing that comes with age, that confidence as well though, isn't it? And I look back now at myself in my 20s and think, oh my gosh, I wish I'd been a bit more punchy. But it's a hard skill to, to learn and develop that. And I think it does come with time and experience as well, doesn't it? But um, someone else has said... You don't said, care as you get older, you don't care. You just get older, <laughs> I, know. Think. <laughs> I know, other people's good opinion means less to you. Um, is them, there's someone else has asked here... Um, what is a skill that you've used over and over that you think everybody should try and use if they can? Is there some, what are your particular skills set that you think has stood you in good, good stead in your career, Anna Marie? Oh, uh, I, I guess I'd go back to the things I learned through sport, um, which uh, probably, probably two things. I, mean, I, I talked a little bit about um, practicing and, you know, perfecting that practice and to give mm. you part of that was part of that sort of building my confidence I suppose not being not being too frightened to put yourself outside your comfort zone mm. um, so one of the things you always do in sport you know if you want to progress physically mm. or mentally you have to push yourself beyond what you think mm. so um, don't be frightened to um, to push yourself beyond that comfort and mm. just don't be frightened to fail sometimes because mm. you'll learn an awful lot mm. and I guess the other thing is is about you know listening properly so when you're being coached you know having having done a lot of competing um and a lot of working with people really truly learning to listen to people mm -hmm. is a uh, a skill that i'm still working at i should say um <laughs> i i think listening to understand people um to really understand what they're saying so you know when you're being coached your coach will tell you something and he doesn't expect you to listen and then answer him back he expects you to listen and to do so you've got to really understand what it is he's asking you to do and only ask questions to help you understand that you don't mm. answer for the sake of answering uh, and you don't answer to disagree you you try to listen and understand and i think mm. it, it, that is probably if that if, if there was one skill i'd like to do better at that's probably one that i'm mm. still working on Mm. just touching on what you said there about stepping outside your comfort zone there is a book i'd recommend for everybody um, listening to this actually that is called the discomfort zone that's written by um farah store who is currently the editor-in-chief of l magazine um which is all about pushing yourself and stretching yourself to the places that you think you can't go to which is really really good um there's another practical question here which is can you advise someone how someone should go about getting onto committees and boards if they want to give back and be, be influential it is hard to work out how to get into these things it is sometimes, and I'm afraid it's largely about networking and meeting people. 
you, you nearly always get something through a connection or a meeting or whatever. I mean, we're all people and humans, so you need to sell, sell yourself as it were. Um, and I think part of that sort of confidence building is that is the ability to just walk up to somebody and introduce yourself say, some, sometimes when you're on your own at an event or whatever else and say, you know, I'm on my own here, but you know, my name's Anna Marie, um, mm. you know, what's your interest in this particular event, this particular sport, this particular piece of art, this particular whatever else and see, and you know, you learn, but, um, I think talking to people and um, connecting with people and asking them if they'll put you in touch with people. I get, I get huge amounts of um, emails and uh, LinkedIn things saying, you know, do you know somebody who can help me with this? Or I'm looking to do that. Can you help me or whatever else? And it's hard to always keep them in your mind, but if I, I will always try and connect somebody with somebody else. And I think, just getting on that first step, getting on the first rung will help you. Um, so just, just do anything. I always say to people, just look for your most local bit. So if you want to get into racing, for example, I'd be saying, do you have a local pony racing club that you can volunteer at? And once you're in volunteering, then how do you, you know, move up to the next bit? And then how do you move up to the next bit? Mm -hmm. um, and, and just find, find simple ways. But sometimes you have to work hard at it. Mm, that's really good advice, Anna Marie. Um, questions flooding in, actually. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, there's a lot of coverage surrounding prize money at the moment. What do you think we can do to ensure that we don't lose small trainers and ensure that racing appeals to the masses for years to come? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, th th I could write you an essay on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're very think, well versed at the moment. Uh, I, I think that it's really important. Um, and I think that diversity of size of trainers is important not just because we want small trainers, but actually that's how people start. So we need mm. to be able to have sustainable small size so that the good trainers can actually grow. We don't, if they're not very good trainers, they, don't, they shouldn't really be existing. Mm. But actually if there are young people starting out, we need, we need an entry level for them. So I think it is really important. Um, I, I think that, that one thing that we need to focus on, and it's not to say that I, I, I absolutely say, think that prize money is key and important, but what we really need is a sustainable, healthy industry. And I think that in order to do that, we need to be able to reach out to the most diverse group of people. So um, I don't know if Tallulah or Susanna is on this, but, you know, diversity in the sport is, is really important for us in the long run. It will be really important for us if we don't, you know, engage with people that, that are different to us or look different to us or have different needs and abilities. You know, they are an increasing percentage of our population um, and we'll just end up with a smaller and smaller group of people interested in our industry. So I, I think, you know, that there are a million other things that we need to do. You know, we, we need to be looking after our, our horses and whatever else. We need to be diversifying our, our revenue streams so we're not totally reliant on any one diverse uh, stream. But actually if we could be as inclusive and diverse, diverse as possible, we've got a, a really good chance of um, maintaining interest and growing and being a healthy and sustainable industry. Yeah, 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 definitely. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, and just to finish, we're just about winding up, Anna Marie, actually, but um, final question, what are your top tips for a successful career? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, this is another one that's popped in. <laughs> no advance warning, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I guess, I have always been lucky in that I've always been able to pursue things that I've been really interested in um, and really enjoy doing. So I, you know, I do feel for, you know, people that work in industries, which they, they just do because it's a job. Mm. Um, and I, I have to say that, you know, my, my, I guess my single top tip would do something that you love doing because you spend so much time doing it. Um, and it can be such heartache and it can be so hard but if you're not, in, you're not enjoying it or you don't see any sort of positive outcome at the end of it, I think I find that really depressing. Mm, mm. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I think that's really good advice. And I think a lot of people work in racing because they love it as well. And, you know, it's such an industry that is, like you say, driven by kind of enjoyment and, and love. Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And thank you so much. Um, if any more questions come in, we will um, try and punt them your way and get answers for people as well. This, as I said, has been recorded. So um, it will be available on the Women in Racing website afterwards. Um, but thank you so much, Anna Maria. It's really good. So yeah, I um, hope everybody's doing a job that they love. Um, do feel free to reach out to uh, the Women in Racing Committee are mostly on LinkedIn. Anna Marie certainly is on LinkedIn. And as you've mentioned, you get a lot of traffic through there as well. Um, we uh, are all on social media and um, like I said, if you have any more questions, do feel free to punt them our way. But for now, thank you, Anna Marie, ever so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to chat to you. Um, your career has been fascinating and um, varied and fulfilling. So um, I know everyone else has really taken a lot from this, um, but I'd just like to thank you again very, very much. If we had a live audience, there would be a round of applause. <laughs> but there yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for everything that Women in Racing do, because I think it's great to have that community um, and to learn from each other and share with each other and you know there is real strength and it is it it's a great place to be a great place to be working I'm sure from time to time people feel lonely in it but you know that that's the time to reach out to those networks and work with people and you'll look back in years to come and, and have made great friends so. yeah well thank you so much and everyone else thank you for joining us and um, we've had a nice healthy number of people here this evening which is great do feel free to share the interview with other people um, and um, we will have the invites out for our next interview in the next few weeks but yes thank you everyone and good night thank you Anna Marie thank you bye bye